for Myanmar, I go to Pakistan. And then in January, I go to Panama. In February, I go to Kenya. In April, I go back to China. In July, I go to Peru. In, in September, I go to DR Congo. And in November, if I can remember where I'm going, I'm going back to India. So if you could pray for me. I am uh, now 57 years old. I, I consider myself a grizzled veteran of the ministry. I've been a Christian for 38 years, a pastor for 33, a missionary for 24. And um, my next trip will be my 68th trip overseas. And I'm still pastoring. Um, is it time to quit already, brother? <laughs> i got to dismiss the kids. See, there's a, that's the effect of the Ukraine, brother Chuck. We've got Chuck and Chucky and Chuck King here today. <laughs> Praise God. Sorry, Chuck. But I just want to, uh, I was thinking, I was thinking about how I've been visiting this church for many years. I say many years. I, I can remember I first came right after Rich Chris Narek was the pastor of this church. And nobody was the pastor at that time. There was a youth pastor here and that was all. And then through the time of Ken Abraham and Woody Barnett and now Pastor Roy and I've appreciated all of those brothers. Amen. And uh, I know you do. And, and I appreciate this fellowship, this church. And I just want you to know I come as a servant of God today. I have no desire to make you feel bad. This is a warning <laughs> to make you mad at me. Or to, to feel you feel condemned or anything else. But I have a burden from the Lord. And I just want to share it with you today. And, and if you'll still have me back Wednesday night, I'll finish up Wednesday evening. But I'd just like to pray with you first. Would, would you pray with me? Father, in Jesus' name, holy is your name. Father, I appreciated the time of praise and worship with my brothers and sisters. My, my extended family, part of the body of Christ. Here today on this beautiful day at the Christian Fellowship Center. Father, I thank you that we are, we are, we are just those who are saved by grace and, and your love and, and your, your ability in us is, is all that matters. Father, I'm asking you now that as I communicate this burden that I believe you've given me, that you will let me do so in the love of Jesus Christ and with humility. And Father, I'm asking you that no one here would, would feel badly when we're finished or, or think I'm crazy or, or want to stone me or get rid of me or whatever. But Lord, may your word come forth. We, we desire that your word be spoken to your church today. There's no opinion that I can offer that's worth anything. But Father, Son and Holy Spirit, if you would begin to work right now through us, those of us gathered, and speak a word to us, then we will truly have fulfilled what we sang in those songs. That you would be first in our lives. That we would enthrone you. Not only in our praises, but through the daily lives we live. Father, may faith come alive in us today. May works come forth by the power of the Holy Spirit. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to share with you today about uh, something I teach a lot on these days. New Testament spiritual leadership. And what I find when I travel overseas, whether it's in China or the Ukraine, when I assemble a group of pastors and leaders and teach these things to them, they are amazed. It's like they've never heard anything like this before. And so... If you're a little bit shocked by what I'm about to tell you, all I ask you to do is ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you. My number one goal in every place I preach is that you, all of you people, brothers and sisters in Christ, would lean on the Holy Spirit and He would become your teacher. And of course we know that the Holy Spirit never, never, never contradicts the Scripture. Now, that'd be a good time for an amen. Hallelujah. So, 
Maybe I've taken away some of your fears right now. Only the Word of God today. Only the Word of God tomorrow, every day. If there's something I've learned in 33 years of being a pastor is that there is tremendous ignorance in the body of Christ concerning the Scripture. The two most important, passionate things we ought to be doing. Seeking my God in prayer. Passionately waiting upon Him for His direction in our lives. And studying His Word so that we will not be led astray by the counterfeits. I'm here to tell you this morning that the devil is working in your life. Because he is a master of deception. And he comes with the same tactics over and over again. From the day in the Garden of Eden when he deceived Eve and then Adam, he constantly uses the same tactic. He deceives people by distorting the Word of God. By taking God's Word and either adding to it or subtracting from it. And I'm here today to stand before you in the fear of God. And the emotion of this is all over me. Because the Holy Spirit, I believe in my heart, is grieved with the state of the affairs of the church in America. And we have exported what we are all around the world. So every church on earth somehow has been affected in the negative by the negativity of the church in America. Folks, if you can't see that the judgment of God is hanging over us, you are blind this morning. The hand of God is moving. And I believe He's moving in response to radical prayer warriors such as myself, who for the last 13 months we've been gathering at noon with six other church pastors and people from their churches, a small group indeed, because you know God's people don't want to pray. But we've been meeting at noon Monday through Friday and calling on heaven itself to move in power, to transform America, because if God doesn't move, we're finished. Not only will we lose everything, in a material sense. But we will lose our very soul. On the airplane coming home yesterday, I was watching a couple of documentaries about John Adams. If you ever get a chance to see them, I didn't know they existed. must be a series that HBO did. John Adams. And it takes us back all the way to the 1770s and how those leaders founded this nation And they signed on the bottom of that document the Declaration of Independence. They committed their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. And I'm here to tell you today that that we have disappointed them. There is no political solution to America's problems today. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, we don't even know how to do that, and turn from their wicked ways, then, then, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins. And there's so much sin in the church, folks. I know, I've been a pastor, I'm pastoring my sixth church now, I know what it's like. I have so much compassion for what you folks are going through. For your leaders. So I come not to throw stones. I'm just an ordinary guy with a burden from God. And I'm here to tell you that if we turn from our wicked ways, that He will hear from heaven. He will forgive our sin. And He will heal our land. I'm here to announce to you today that Jesus Christ wants His church back. He's tired of preachers 
who have usurped His authority and have taken on what they were never called to take on and to be what they were never called to be and to squeeze the very life out of the body ministry of, of the church of God by taking over the headship. I'm here to tell you that we need to take another look. Not at the functioning and the practice of the church for the last 1900 years, but we need to look into that first hundred years for the answers to all of our problems. I want to tell you this is not a popular message. Because I've come to mess with everything you do. I feel like a reformer. God knows what they do to reformers. Let me give you a nutshell before we go further. Nutshell picture. First hundred years, body of Christ so powerful. Oh God, I yearn for those days. Peter could walk down the street. And they would drag the sick in front of his shadow. And, and they would all be healed. Is that happening in our churches today? Cast out demons. Preach the gospel. They didn't care about themselves. They didn't care about money. They didn't care about buildings. They didn't care about organizations. Because, you know, there is only one scripturally. It's called the body of Christ. We've carved it up into 40,000 denominations and God wasn't responsible for any one of them, brother. Not even one. One Lord. One faith. You understand? One baptism. One God and Father of us all who is over all and through all and in all. He is the head of the body. And we are humble servants, that's all. You are a member of the body of Christ, brother, by the grace of God. You and I, we're just human beings. I love you too, man. I do love you. You're fired up, aren't you? There's nothing good in me. Nothing! Except for the grace of God. Not one sermon, not one act of kindness, not one... Righteous act in my life can be done apart from the grace of God. So how on earth can I elevate myself and want to be called reverend or bishop or apostle? Everything I have is to be poured out for the body of Christ and for the glory of God. When I'm hungry, some of you are already getting there, aren't you? And I go, my body gets hungry, which you can tell by the looks of me, that doesn't happen very often. But when I get, when I think I'm hungry, and I sit down to a sumptuous meal, I'll tell you what, there's no competition in this human body. Everything in me is waiting for the hand to reach down for that big chunk of turkey. Ooh, just savoring with rich, uh, rich, ooh, sauce, you know. Are you getting the vision now? And, and my foot's not saying, I want to do that. And my arm's not, and my, my leg's not saying, I want some attention. They're saying, go, go, go. And then when the mouth takes that first bite, there's no argument, no competition in the body. Everybody's cooperating, expecting good things because the body's controlled by the head. All the rest of us are servants. If I don't leave anything with you today, I want you to know that you are nothing. You are a bondservant of God, purchased by the blood of Jesus, saved by His grace. And anything you do, I don't care if you cast out demons or prophesy or heal the sick or raise the dead. If you do it, it's because of Him. How can I start a ministry in my name? And become a rich man profiteering on the materialistic carnality of this world. But that's what many preachers are doing. They're not spiritual leaders. 
They're false apostles. Angels of light. Whom Satan is using. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. And these preachers that preach prosperity are liars. Oh, I'm telling you, I'm come to stir you up today. If you are a lover of money, my friend, you have disqualified yourself from spiritual leadership. Because an elder must not be a lover of money. We've got to return to the biblical standard of a needs-based ministry. We've got to get rid of the greed in preachers' lives, in the rest of our lives. And we've got to realize, why am I here? What does God want for me? That first church was so powerful that the, the great multitude of them and their leaders laid down their lives to be faithful. They did more in a hundred years than we could ever dream of. And they had almost no money, no computers, no email. And if you can believe this, no cell phones. I can't believe how addicted we are to cell phones. And I'll tell you this, it's not just us. Everywhere I go, poorest people in the world overseas, they got a cell phone. They look like dirty bums, but they got cell phones in their hands. But Jesus had to deal with people like this. Jesus had to deal with the Pharisees who had adopted an oral law and tradition that had spanned the centuries. They said it even came from Moses because, listen to this, this is bizarre, but I'm going to make an application. You're going to realize it's not so bizarre. They believed that when Moses was on the mountain, he got two laws. He got one to write down and one that was given to him orally. And that oral law was a secret behind the scenes thing that he passed down to Joshua and Joshua passed it down to the elders and the elders passed it down to the judges and the judges passed it down to the prophets. You know, like behind the scenes stuff, secretive, like the Lord told me stuff. You ever see that in a charismatic renewal? Just read the Elijah list. You still love me now? And by the time Jesus came on the scene, that oral law had become so important to the Jews that it was to be obeyed. Listen to me now. I know you don't want to believe this, but this is history. You can study it. And I just want to tell you, I was stirred up in the, before I got this book, but I'm going to leave this book. Chuck, if I put this in your hands, can I trust you to get it to your pastor? You can read it in between if you want to. It's not a problem. It's called the, the Biblical Church by a man named Beresford Job. He's an English fella. He put all this history together. You can find it on the internet. You can look it up in the library. You can read about the early church fathers. And you can see what they wrote themselves. And of course you can read the scripture so you know what's true and what isn't. Amen. Well, Jesus ran into these people by the time John the Baptist came to prepare the way. And remember, what did John do? He called the nation back to the word of God, didn't he? He called, he, they were so far away, they had to repent. And then Jesus constantly bashed heads with these Pharisees, scribes, and teachers of the law because they began to believe their traditions before they believed the word of God. In their own writings... And you'll see, I put some stuff up there for history lesson for you. You see, no, go back one, brother. Sorry, you're doing a good job, though. Uh, you see that word Mishnah? Okay, that was the oral, the oral law that they added to the Scripture. And later on, in 200 A.D., it was finally written down by some rabbis. Until that time, it was verbally handed down. Then the Gemara ended up being a, a commentary, eventually written, on the Mishnah. And together, the Mishnah and the Gemara make up the book, which you may have heard this term before, the Talmud. All right? And what they said in, in the Mishnah, they said this. First, obey the law of the scribe 
before you obey the word of God. You say, oh my, but in a few minutes you're going to say, oh me. And they believed that their words were the words of God. They were inspired. They, they conflicted with Scripture. And you know, you know what I'm talking about. Jesus came and he ran uh, constantly to these guys. And let me tell you something about our Lord Jesus. He did it purposely. Jesus could pick a fight as well as anybody. And he'd go to these guys and, and he, he, would, uh, he would challenge them. For example, here you'll see on, on the first slide... The second slide, they added 1,500 rules or laws to the one commandment to keep the Sabbath. 1,500. And two of them, I want to give you examples examples of these. You weren't allowed to harvest any grain. You weren't allowed to thresh. You weren't allowed to, to, to gather it. You weren't allowed to store it. And so you remember the account where Jesus was walking through the grain fields on the Sabbath day? And they start eating it. They were breaking, purposely breaking, the law of the Jews. Because, you know, when you walk through a field, you're going to knock down a few few grains off the stalk. And then you're going to tramp on them. And then you're going to thresh them because they're going to break open. And then if a bird comes along, you're going to store it. Isn't that stupid? But that's what they believed. And so Jesus did it purposely. And then he challenged them. Here's another one. This says this directly. I read it right out of this book in their Mishnah that you're not allowed to heal on the Sabbath. And one of the categories of healing on the Sabbath was you're not allowed to take spit and mix it with mud and anoint a man's eyes. Come on. So what did Jesus do? Come on. What a powerful thing. He told them, you have neglected the word of God for the sake of your traditions. Am I talking to a New Testament church here? And so Jesus had these problems and it cost him his life. Because he never backed down. I want to turn to a couple of scriptures quickly. First, well, you can see it up on the screen. First Corinthians chapter 11. Verse number two, I want to talk about good tradition because any tradition that that obeys the word of God is good tradition. I'm trying to get your minds. I heard someone pray, pull down strongholds. You know, that's our problem today. Strongholds are in your mind. It's bad thinking. Until you get those things out of there and renewed and transformed by the word of God, you're not going anywhere spiritually. 1 Corinthians 11, verse number 2. Paul says, and I want you to know, by the way, Paul, as much as we know, and there's not a historian in church history that would disagree with this, that Paul taught the same thing in every church. And he was a stubborn old brother. Not that we aren't stubborn. But he insisted that they would obey. I mean, it wasn't a suggestion. He said, this is what you do. You obey what we've taught you. Because look, I didn't get it from a man. I got this directly from Jesus. I praise you for remembering me in everything. And for holding to the teachings. NIV NIV says teachings. But uh, what's this say? Tradition? Oh, you don't have it up there. Okay. Now go back, brother. I'll use my clicker. That's another. Go one more. You just do what you want to do. It's fine. (laughs) In my footnote, it says traditions. Teachings or traditions are interchangeable in English. Uh, Also, 2 Thessalonians, real quickly. 2 Thessalonians, chapter 2, verse 15. 2 Thessalonians 2, 15. Here's what it says. I better get in second instead of first. There's my jet lag again. Second Thessalonians 2.15. So then, brothers, stand firm and hold to the teachings or traditions we passed on to you, whether by word of mouth or by letter. Then in chapter 3, verse 6, it says... 
in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we command you. Does that sound like a suggestion? We command you, brothers, to keep away from every brother. Now, these are false brothers. These are brothers, but they're, they're, they've got some problems. From brother who is idle and does not live according to the teaching or tradition you received from us. Now, I want to go ahead. As soon as the Apostle John died, about A.D. 95 or 100, right after he got the book of Revelation given to him by the Holy Spirit, he was the last living original apostle. And I'm telling you, those guys were special. God used them to write the Scripture, including the Apostle Paul, who, in my opinion, really took Judas's place. I have no Scripture for that, but that's my opinion. And these men God carried along by the Holy Ghost and gave them the words to write down and we are so blessed today because we have the New Testament. Hallelujah. These men were given such grace to do what they did. As soon as they were gone, however, problems arose. In fact, while they were ministering, problems arose. Paul warned sternly the church in Galatia, the church in Corinth, about leaving the original gospel and receiving another gospel. You remember those scriptures? Different spirit, different gospel. And in the book of Revelation, the seven churches, out of seven, five were apostate. Now this is before the end of the first century. While John's still alive, five of seven, unless they repented from their grievous sins, the Lord was going to take away their lampstand. Amen? So these problems, the Gnostic error... All kinds of false teachers, false prophecies. Everybody was hearing from God and spouting things off. Thus saith the Lord. And it was bizarre stuff. Some didn't even believe that Jesus really died. They believed it was like an apparition on the cross. It wasn't really him. Now, I'm laying the background for that so you understand where these early church fathers came from. They were the ones that basically followed those original apostles. But they were at a disadvantage, my friends, because the New Testament, as we know it, even though it was written already by the end of the first century, it had not been put together as the canon or the rule of Scripture until the fourth century. So from the end of the first century until the fourth century, they were basically... Uh, going on whatever they had, bits bits and pieces of Paul's epistles, some of the teachings of Jesus. You understand what I'm saying. So when all these errors started to break out, they were at a disadvantage. And so they made a grievous mistake. And they began to mess around with the order that the Holy Spirit set up for the New Testament church. And so... I want to give you some of their names. I just look at this. Within 200 years, go back one more, brother. You did what I said, but I'm I'm jet lagged. Within 200 years of the death of John, the last living original apostle of Jesus, this happened. But before the New Testament canon was decided, okay, next next slide, brother. These are the names of of six of the men who who created what I call the situation for the church today. You can see their names. Clement of Rome, A.D. 95. Ignatius of Antioch, year 100. Justin Martyr, who lived around 160. Irenaeus of Smyrna, 170. Tertullian of Carthage, 200. And Cyprian of Carthage, 250. They came up with this invention called apostolic succession. Have you ever heard of that? Let me try to bring it down to a place where you can grab a hold of this. Listen, I've been, I've been in ministry a lot of years, Christian for 38, pastor for 33. I told you all that already. But I'm just now starting to get a hold of some of these things. So I understand if it's a little confusing to you. But bear with me, and I believe this thing will change your life. This message. Apostolic succession. Here's what they said. 
God sent Jesus. Jesus handpicked his original apostles. And then they picked us. That means our authority to proclaim what is the word of God is the same as theirs. In fact, here's what they told the people. They said the, the word of the bishop is like Jesus Christ on earth. And the word of the priests is like that of the original apostles. Now you might think that sounds familiar. But let me take you on a simple tour for a couple minutes of what New Testament church leadership really is. I already started to tell you that we're all servants. Jesus told his leaders... I'm all for leadership. I believe I'm a strong leader. I'm at least a loud leader. And a bold leader. I believe in strong leadership in the context of the scripture. And Jesus said, call no man rabbi, call no man father, because you're all brothers. But the greatest among you be the least servant. Don't be like those Gentiles. They lord it over people and exercise their authority. I want to keep reminding you there's only one head of the church. When men start raising up their, their own carnal natures and say they're in charge, that's when we've got to get worried. So how did the church function? Under compassionate servant leadership. Yes, they were strong leaders. They had gifts and callings of God that were unique. But they did not consider themselves more important than any other believer. In fact, the scripture exhorts us that we should think of everyone else more highly than we think of ourselves. Am I preaching the gospel to you, brother? And so, and I want to tell you this, for longer than the United States of America has been a nation, the early church met in homes. For over 300 years, there was no talk of church buildings. Not a word from Jesus about church buildings, except he's going to destroy them all in Jerusalem. Not a word from the apostles on church buildings. But a lot of word about preaching the gospel and going to every nation and sending out workers and supporting them. Teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. I'm here to tell you, and I hope you still love me when I'm finished because you have a beautiful facility here. That there is going to be no reward in heaven for this building for anybody. My brother, you, I know you have common sense. Because you've been amen in me. That tells me you've got common sense. But if Jesus never said anything about buildings, if the apostles, I'm not talking about those guys that strut around today. I'm talking about the original apostles. Anything in the New Testament. If it doesn't say anything about church buildings, can I ask a stupid question? Why are we so preoccupied with church buildings? You know what they did? They met at home, small groups, 10, 20, 30 people all over the cities. They were known by their geography, church at Corinth. Church at Philippi, it wasn't the first church of this and the last church of that. It was one church. They had problems. There were lots of problems. I'm not trying to tell you they were perfect people. They were human beings. But they didn't have the divisions we have. They didn't have the priorities we have. And the only thing they were concerned about was taking the gospel to the nations. At any cost. Where is our money going to go? It's going to go sending workers, helping the poor. Church buildings... Where did we get that? You don't find it anywhere in the scripture. 
Now, I have compassion for you, brethren, because I've been caught up in this for so many years of my ministry as well. But God stopped me in my tracks and said, why don't you start practicing what you've been preaching? And I had to pull away from all this and take another look and see it's true. They met in homes, in small groups. And guess what? They were just like family to one another. There was no stranger among them because they loved and cared for each other like a husband, wife, brother, and sister. Yeah, they fought sometimes. Do I freak you out when I walk back here like this? <laughs> they loved each other. They knew the good things, the bad things, inside out. And you know how they picked their elders? By the way, if you go to Acts chapter 20, if you go to 1 Peter chapter 5, you get the teachings of Paul and Peter. How many believe their teaching was honored by the Holy Ghost? And I'm going to tell you in a nutshell. An elder, the Greek word for elder... It's presbyteros. It's the word we get presbyter from. An elder, according to the Greek, is a mature believer, an experienced believer of integrity. And that same elder, and it's always plural, it's never singular. So where do we get this idea of one man over each church? Elders. Well, that was loud. Presbyteros, the same men that are elders, Paul calls them and Peter calls them bishops. An elder is a bishop. It's not a different person. The same man, it's a bishop. And we use the, the other term in English, overseer for bishop. An elder is a bishop. And guess what? An elder who is a bishop is a pastor. The same Men are elders, bishops, and pastors. There is no hierarchy in the kingdom of God except that Jesus Christ is Lord. And then all the rest of us are right underneath Him, equal in Christ. Hallelujah. Neither male nor female, bond nor free, rich or poor. Does that free you up today? So, they were, they were men who were servants, gifted and called of God. They were preachers of the word. I'm telling you, power coming out of their lives, word coming out, prayer coming out. All they did was care for the poor. Number one priority, care for the poor, send out workers. And they didn't care about anything except that their needs, uh, say needs, were met. I'm preaching the gospel to you today. And what happened in these small house church meetings is everybody was just important as the other. Because God gave one a word. God gave another a tongue, a prophecy. I'm preaching scripture to you now. First Corinthians chapter 14. Another had a revelation. Another had a hymn. But everybody came to that meeting that night expecting that the Holy Ghost was going to move upon them and they were going to share something. Hallelujah. They weren't going to sit back there like you are, staring at the back of the other person's head in front of you, staring at some goofy, loud, fat, spitting preacher. We've turned this thing into entertainment. Where'd we get that authority? Brother, the Holy Ghost is all over you. I want to ask you, brother, where do we get that authority? Do we get it from Jesus or do we mess around and take it for ourselves? This is the burden of my heart. The church fathers did this to us. If you haven't figured it out yet, put their names back up. And I don't want you to hate them or anything because in many ways they were, they were good men. They did what they could do, but they messed up. And they began to say, okay, you could flip the next one. They began to believe they were powerful men. Exactly the opposite of what the New Testament teaches. You know, the problem I have with the carnality of the church is that the carnal nature of man can never please God. The carnal nature of man is always in opposition to the Spirit of God. 
And so when these leaders took the church down that path of carnality, we were almost finished right away. Apostolic succession. You know what that meant? You got it. Here's what they did. The first guy, I'll read his name, Clement. He said that we're going to go back to the Old Testament and we're going to set up a hierarchy of priests. Just like there was the, there was the Levite, there was the priest, and then there was the high priest. Hello? Do you know we're in the New Testament now? We're all priests and kings. There is no need for a high priest because we've got one. His name is Jesus. We'll never need another one. Hallelujah. And so we had them set up a hierarchy. And the priest, one man was put over a church. Total control. Do what I say. And unfortunately through history, it was not do as I do. Because there were immoral men of all kinds throughout the history. That, that 1,200 years, from about 300 till Martin Luther came along with that wonderful word from God. Isn't it sad that it took 1,300 years? For them to realize that the just shall live by faith. They were in such darkness because of these church fathers. Total control. You couldn't baptize a new believer without their permission. You couldn't have house church without their permission. You couldn't have your love feast, which was a full meal with communion in the middle of it, without permission of the bishop. When you got baptized, before you got baptized, they'd make you wait three years. Now, where do you get that from the Scripture? My Bible tells me as soon as they were saved, they got baptized. Come on. Am I right, brother? So where do we get the authority to put believers through classes for six months before we baptize them? You got it from the church fathers. That's where you got it. They'd baptize at Easter every year. And if you were a candidate for baptism, you had to jump through every hoop of the bishop and the priest, or they'd just shun you. That's, what the, that's where Lent came from, because these people were fasting and praying during the time leading up their baptism. That's where the Lenten tradition comes from. Hello. A perverted water baptism. Not only did they delay baptism, but they came up with this notion that the power of God wasn't in the faith response of a, of a new believer to cause him to be born again and, and sealed with the Holy Ghost, but the power was in the water itself. Have you ever heard the term baptismal regeneration? So they believe the water had the power of God. So the more we get in the water... The more people we have in our churches, so they start baptizing babies. Now, where'd they get that? Where do the churches today get that? You don't get it from the scripture. You get it from the church fathers. The seed bed of error began with this one issue of who are really the spiritual leaders and how should they function. And every heir that has come down the road since those early days have started with the heir of defining the leaders. And we have today a church that is so far removed from the New Testament, it's a joke. We are no longer family. We don't even know each other. And all of you people here don't even know the names of the people in this place. Now, who told you to do that? Who told you to come and, and congregate in big numbers inside a public building and stare and get entertained and walk out like nobody knows who you are. No accountability. Sinners can come in here and live like the devil in your midst and you won't even know it. Now I'm going to point at you, brother. I love you. <laughs> You're my friend. I should qualify that. I'm not calling anybody out today. Do we have trouble in the church? Don't tell me you don't. Immoral people in your ranks. I'll tell you what we should do. We, we need to deal with it. One by one, brother to brother, sister to sister, expose it without repentance, they're out. 
so that maybe by the mercy of God, the conviction of the Holy Ghost will lead them to repentance. But we include everybody. The more the merrier. I don't know you. You don't know me. I know you only because I see your face at meetings. I don't go to your house anymore. We don't want trouble with that. Hospitality is almost a lost gift in the church. We don't eat meals together. We don't minister one to another. We, aren't even, we don't even care about each other. Let's get right down to it. I've been a pastor. I'm not stupid. My life and my family have been tragically affected by these things. You know, I was riding on a plane yesterday with a pilot coming back from, from Philadelphia. And, and, and we started talking. It turned out he's a believer. He really wasn't know what I was doing. I was telling him. And he was impressed with the help, help that we give to the poor. And, and he asked for, I gave him one of my cards. And, and he said, you know, I'll be hearing from him. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hope I do hear from him. But he said something as a pilot. He said, if I'm off by three degrees on my flight plan, you know what that does to a pilot? Three degrees, brother. Three degrees. You know, it just keeps getting bigger. You see, once we get off the track, it just gets worse. And the only thing we can do is go all the way back and fix it and start again. This church does not need revival. This church needs reformation. When Martin Luther started preaching the just to live by faith and his friends rose up to support him, they started killing those Christians. Who started killing the Christians? The offspring of the early church fathers. A few hundred years later, some dear Anabaptists rose up and rediscovered the truth that believers ought to be baptized, not infants. And guess what happened to them? Sometime later, at Azusa Street, at the turn of the 1900s, the Pentecostal outpouring began and it spread around the world. And guess who began to be persecuted from that point on? Every one of them by the previous movement. Mostly so-called believers persecuting other believers. And I'm telling you, my brothers and sisters, if you embrace this message today, you are going to suffer persecution. Because the status quo is, we're going to get together, have a private meeting where nobody ever knows me. I'm going to put in my time, throw a few bucks in the offering plate, say the right words, and go home and do anything else I want to do. They turned the family of God into an organization. That's what they did. And they started building big buildings and meeting together by the hundreds. And nobody participated anymore except the priest. How is God glorified in that? I'm here to tell you that they stopped the family gathering in the homes and they turned communion into a ritual. A little piece of some kind of bread, little thing of wine, in a very somber, ceremonious time, in the middle of a service, the Lord Jesus, after He was betrayed. You understand what I'm saying? I've done this all my ministry, I know. But what they did is everybody brought a bowl of food, a plate of food. They got together with their little family on the Lord's Day once a week. And they had a great time of worship. Everybody participated. Everybody was fulfilled. God spoke through His body. Does that sound scriptural, brother? And then they had a big feast together. Woo! Come on, chicken. Come on. Put it, fill in the blank. And sometime during that meeting... By the way, when Jesus first instituted the Lord's Supper, do you know he did it in the context of the Passover meal? Which was a full meal. At Passover.
Passover, going back to Moses, it was a full meal. Jesus was taking a full meal with his disciples, and then he took the bread and the cup. And I'm telling you, whoo, there's coming a day on that great getting up morning when the dead in Christ shall rise and the blessed uh, uh, supper of the wedding feast of the Lamb is going to take place. And I'm sure glad, brother, when I get there, the Lord won't just hand me some little wafer and a little thing of wine. And for you teetotalers, to, come on, it's going to be a wedding feast. Woo! They called Jesus a glutton and a wine bibber. That tells you his eating habits, Dwight. Amen. Come on. So what gave us, gives us the right to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ and come in here like a sanctimonious big shot and hold up a little wafer and a little piece of and a little cup of wine? You know where you got it? You got it from those guys. They're the ones that perverted it. And we're following in their footsteps. In fact, I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, brethren, that this church and almost every church on the face of this, this earth is not following the New Testament pattern of practice, but we're following the teachings of the church fathers. Can I talk to you like your brother? I'm broken hearted. Jesus died to change the world. And we have perverted and changed the gospel. It's no wonder we're suffering the way we are. It's no wonder God is not moving among us. And I'm here to ask you as your brother, don't, please don't be condemned. I've gone through this whole process. It's painful. I had to resign my church of over 200 people to do what I'm doing today because I saw that this thing is broken and it just doesn't work. And it's never going to get fixed unless we get on our knees and seek the face of God and open up the pages of His Holy Word and let Jesus take control once again of the reins of His church. And we stop picking men because they've had a certain degree or because, you understand what I'm saying, or they've got a certain credential. Where's that in the Bible? You didn't get that from Jesus. You got that from those guys. It's time that we choose our leaders based on character and holiness and purity. They're our example. I'm to be the finest example of a Christian on the face of this earth so people can follow me. Follow me as I follow Christ. Most of our leaders can't even spit that because they are such hypocrites. Would you stand with me? Holy Ghost. Come on, cry out with me, would you? Holy Ghost. We have left the way, Father, forgive us. We have begun to control everything. We say that you're in charge, but we know what the meeting's going to be like before we come in the door. Father, forgive us. We're all dirty in this thing. There's not one of us here who can say we've done it right. Father, forgive us. Have mercy, Lord. We come with confidence in the blood of Jesus. We have no other confidence. We have no other hope. And we are here to repent today, Lord. I'm praying you start the process at Christian Fellowship Center. Father, if they never invite me back again, May your word go forth and purify my words by the power of the Holy Ghost so they don't hear from a man. They hear from you. Lord, this church has a great, wonderful group of people who love you. They just don't know exactly what to do at this time. They, you have spoken to them. They've heard some things. 
They've been broken and tested, especially in the last several years. Oh, God. Oh, God. I pray for my brothers and sisters. You would comfort them at their losses. But, Father, you've been speaking because you're trying to get your message through. And, Father, after I've left this place today, I am confident that I've given them your word. And I pray that your word will bear fruit here. Lord, you would take them and lead them. Show them what to do, Pastor Roy, all these leaders, my God. You're going to have to change us, Lord. Because we've been brainwashed. We have, we have hang-ups and strongholds that have been handed down for 1,900 years. Oh, God. And so we're asking you, Father, in Jesus' name, that you would have your way. If you mean that today, my friends, it's going to cost you. Because from this point on, you're responsible. You hear what I'm saying? You might say, that guy's nuts. Why would Pastor Roy have a man like that come in the pulpit? But you're responsible. And I pray that you start digging and studying. And test the scriptures. And start asking, why am I doing what I'm doing? Amen? I'm going to quit now because I didn't know what time it is. I'm sorry if I went over. Forgive me if I did, but, but you can tell I'm a passionate man. <laughs> and I love you very much, even though you think I'm crazy. I forgive you. Because I've, people said worse things than that about me. <laughs> brother Chuck, it's all yours, brother.